everyone and welcome to the latest Down the Rabbit Hole interview. Today I'm joined by William da Silveira, who's going to tell us all about the fascinating field of space omics. So without further ado, William, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Oh, sure. Thank you for having me. It's been a surprising pleasure to be involved in this event. So I'm quite happy to be here today and to to attend the, the event next January. Whoa, <laughs> I do a lot of things nowadays. Uh, so I started as a pharmacist, you know, a full bench guy. And then I, I have to go to transcriptomics to keep doing my analysis. And I worked as a bioinformatics analyst for three years uh, in my postdoc. And at this point, I was working with literally everything. The, I was in the medical University of South Carolina at that point in the US and uh, bioinformatics core. So basically everything involved with bioinformatics passed through the core at one point and most part of it passed through me. Uh, and that of one day, uh, my boss knocked at my, my door and said, oh, I received an email from NASA. They're trying to find some projects here in the state. Would be interested, like, <laughs> would I? <laughs> course I am. <laughs> so we set it up uh, a small project and that was the beginning of my of my involvement with NASA. Uh, after that we saw an advertisement from the project called Genelab, uh, the Genelab working uh, working group. So I tried to convince my boss to join. He didn't need that much convincing. So we entered, but he was basically said, you know, I'm too busy. Is your thing, do whatever, <laughs> just keep doing your thing. So we ended, uh, we ended up with that. I, of course, keep doing my job. Uh, my PhD was in constant transcriptomics. I, I work at more network biology and so on. But this is basically what led me to here today because that faithful uh, knock on the door and some strange decisions after that ended up with me on the GenLab multi-omics analysis uh, group. Uh, and, and then because of a lot of other things and because of my, my, my involvement on bioinformatics score and my strong biological background, I ended up being the guy who, who could connect the dots. Uh, yeah, that's an, that's an amazing story. Um, yeah, I think that's that's like a great intro to, you know, how you've got into this space. Um, obviously, space omics isn't something you come across <laughs> every day. No. Um, was it just was it just pure chance that you sort of got into that, or were you interested in it before? It was pure chance. I was not even aware of the existence of that before I entered. Because when you think NASA, you think yeah, rocket satellites. I was not. Well, I, I imagine they have to do something with biology to maintain the astronauts alive, but was not my thing. But uh, one thing that have to be clear here is that I am Brazilian. Uh, I'm not from the US or the UK. I'm living there and I'm living here now, but I'm not. And from my perspective, I never really thought I would I would work in space research. <laughs> and that was my principal thing. And that was like literally out of my reach in my mind. <laughs> and then when it became a reality, like, okay, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, we'll we'll get into more detail yeah. about like some of your research projects that are really interesting. Um, but could you maybe give us a bit of like a summary of some of the key areas that you're working on at the moment? Okay. So, uh, right <laughs> now, I'm working much more on teaching. Like, um, it's been a uh, evolution of my of my career. You know, there's one point that I have to focus more. So I'm teaching a lot. Uh, principally in genomics and bioinformatics, but on the research aspect, I'm trying to build up on our 2020 paper. So we did a multi-omics analysis of really a lot of, of uh, different organs and different cell lines and even astronauts to see what would be happening with the astronauts. And we ended up seeing a lot of things have to do with mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, but there was a lot of stories you could not tell there. That was our principal story. So from there, I've been working with two things. Uh, first, to build, to help to build a network on space omics on Europe itself. So this is the space omics topical team that is funded by ESA. I co, I'm co-head of the of the of the team. 
Uh, but more personally, I've been working with some students to follow through that. So we just published a paper last month to see the crosstalk between liver and muscles to see how they could be interacting with each other. And we have only transcriptomics to work with. Uh, we do know that uh, muscle wasting in space have a mitochondrial component that does not have here on Earth. But this is what's known before me. This was a discovery in 2004. Uh, but we do also know that the liver is one of the principal organs of the metabolism of the whole body. So we're trying to see how they interact. They interact, for example, in diabetes. So we could find some correlation between genes. And of course, the next big thing is to try to, to see if we can alter that. So I'm trying to find some collaboration, some funding on that, to work on how to not only to see the problem, but how to solve the problem, be to use that as a framework for my bigger research that then focus on network biology, how to mm -hmm. understand how this is, is uh, being altered and discover critical points that we could try to intervene to make this not to happen. Wow, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot, like you say, to, to <laughs> delve into there. Um, yeah. That's a good, brilliant overview. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of going back to the sort of basics question, but um, just in case anybody out there doesn't isn't sure, um, what is space omics? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I have not answered the basic question. So <laughs> I, I think we have to to tackle okay omics, you know, have the whole field of omics, transcriptomics, genomics, and so on. Uh, and if you, you can apply to to any anything, you can apply to uh, diabetes, you can apply for aging, and so on. Uh, but space omics is to apply all these technologies to, to space biology on on space. So in the animals, the astronauts, and so on. Why this is important? First, because we have a very limited number of experiments of astronauts that ever go to space. The very, very limited number. It's very expensive. And with omics, we can extract the maximum of information we can for that samples. So we could, on the cost benefit, we are trying to in, increase the benefits. Uh, for you to have an idea, this whole paper we're talking about the about about cell, we never send anything to space. We are using data that were already sent to space, and we're the only ones to try to put all together at the same time. And we found something with that that no one could have found before. And this by itself was really, really powerful, you know. And this again, as like I said, this was the only, the first thing we could see. There was a lot of stories we could tell too. We just told the, the most, uh, uh, the, the strongest story we could find. What we hope from that is to be able to, to produce better data to support astronauts in the future. Not only on the International Space Station, you know, the International Space Station is going down at one point, but uh, NASA, ESA, and other agencies building the, uh, the models on the, on the moon, they're trying to send people to Mars and so on. And there's one specific thing that makes this discovery quite important. Uh, a travel to Mars and back can take up to three years, three years in space. And we do know that this mitochondrial dysfunction we, we found signals of, uh, kind of got back to normal when the astronauts are back. At least this is what we could we could measure. But we also know that mitochondrial dysfunctions can act differently, and we don't know exactly how this could play out in space. But principally, the signals get stronger with time. So as, as we get this happening and happening, whatever can happen can happen more. Um, so, that's that's really interesting. Um, so, um, these applications from the from the sort of research in space omics don't just apply to space travel. Um, are there also applications back on Earth? Oh yes, of course. Uh, I can think of two more more specifically, but of course I'm sure there will be more on that. Uh, when this paper got finally published, the first thing I did was to contact the I think the Mitochondrial Disease Federation is the, the UMDF, the United Mitochondrial Disease Federation, I think is the name, but the UMDF for sure, uh, because there is rare diseases, rare mitochondrial diseases that at this point they have not much treatment. 
and not much time on spotlight. They're quite, quite rare. Uh, so I sent it, the paper to them and we had a, a good meeting, me and Afshin Behesti, the, the last author on the paper, with the director of their, the, with the idea of bringing more attention to the diseases. So, but of, although this is quite important, would imagine that because it's that rare, uh, people would think, oh, okay, that's nice, but you know, don't change the word. Uh, but the thing is that um, I really hope that everyone listen to, to this video and, and you and myself, with you will have at one point mitochondrial dysfunction. Why? Because this is what happens as you get older. Right. As you get older, your metabolism starts to change. A lot of things change. And one of the things that change that your mitochondria don't uh, work so well. Uh, this influence a lot of things. For example, it's increased your chance of have type 2 diabetes. Uh, but also uh, change a lot of, of your metabolism. And in the end, of course, if you cannot produce that much energy, then, then we die. Uh, so the point is, if you find anything good for the astronauts to fight against uh, aging in space, because this, uh, I think I forgot to say, we can use a space flight as a model for accelerated aging, because a lot of things that happen with astronauts look like they're aging really fast. They're losing muscle mass, they're losing bone, uh, bone density, a lot of other problems that could be related to that too, including uh, vision and, and hearing. So there's a lot of things happening with them there. Uh, whatever we find to have the astronauts can be used directly to help us here. One of the principal things, uh, problems of health aging is that we start to lose muscle mass. We simply do. And this is one of the reasons why the astronauts make two hours of exercise every day. If you could find a way to make goals lower uh, to the astronauts, we can use directly on our on more people here that are getting older to make this event to happen less and less. Then a lot of the problems that could happen because of this, like a lot of fouls and people don't be able to be that independent would be ameliorated. What's good for everyone? People are happy, we spend less money on health, the government spends less money on you. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. So this this is how this this research can be useful for all of us here. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um <clears throat> it's really fascinating. It's it's great to see how like research in space can space could be applied um back on Earth. Um so um, yeah, you've, we've kind of started talking about it. So I think we should just um, go straight into that 2020 paper a little bit more. Um, so yeah, this was about how um, space flight causes mitochondrial stress. Um, I realized you sort of talked a little bit about that already. Um, and I saw actually that it was recently cited over a hundred times. So congratulations. Yeah, on that. I, was, I was quite uh, long. It's, it's the first paper I, I have reaching that amount of citations in so little time like you know yeah. I was quite happy <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing um but yeah so like so we've kind of started talking about some of the applications already but um what what kind of question or research question were you trying to answer with this study uh, so that's that's the thing that they're difficult with omics research mm. it's quite easy to get lost if you don't have a specific question to try to dig on the data. So we started uh, the analysis really broad. So we were basically, our, our initial, initial questions were more technical than biological. We, we wanted to find ways. We have this huge amount of data in GenLab, and we can talk more about GenLab in a moment, uh, but we didn't have a way to try to put them together and see how, how to build these small pieces together to give an overall picture of what was happening. That was quite difficult, quite, quite difficult. And we have, and I'm, uh, I always say that I had the honor to be the first author on the on the paper, but were a seventh co-first authors, and I think it was eight or nine senior authors and 38 scientists for like lots of different issues. It was a huge effort for a lot of people. And I'm quite proud to and honored to be here talking to you about it. Uh, so it was quite difficult in the beginning because, you know, everyone was doing one piece, everyone was doing a different thing. And, and at one point we work at the problem of the field, that how, how to put them back together. 
know, the pieces were giving us one thing, one thing here, one thing there, and how, how we could put uh, these together. So that was the point where I could help too, technically. Uh, with my biological background, what I proposed to them to do was to do two things. First, not to try to, to integrate them on the gene level, because that will be really complicated. We have different technologies, different things happening. That will be, uh, I would really find difficult to find genes and all of the things that we're doing the same. So we got out of that. So we decided to integrate on the system level, what pathways are being altered in different ways. Then if we go to genes after that. That's one of the first decision. A second decision is that because we have so many different data from so many different technologies, it was really difficult to put everything in the same, like harmonize the whole thing. So we decided to analyze each data set as itself independently. And then we will try to, to integrate the results at the system level. We use it at GSEA, Gene uh, Set Enrichment Analysis. That's a simple and powerful analysis that I really love. Uh, the visualization was done by a group on California, but we, we use it all across, all across the, the groups. Everyone was using it. I was myself first, uh, by lucky or not, to say the truth, I choose to, to go on that, to analyze the liver. Because as a biochemist, I okay, so you know, if we are trying to find something in common with everyone else, I'm sure the liver will be involved in it. So I started to analyze the liver. Uh, and I remember uh, I have to do this in my free time. So I remember it was a Sunday. I was back on work. I have just finished the analysis. And I said, that's really strange. What why this look like this look like diabetes? What the hell a liver? in space would look like that. Beatles, it makes no sense. But one thing start to build in the other, start to build in the other, start to build in the other. And I start to present the, the analysis. And mitochondria was always my favorite organelle. So one thing, uh, you know, everything ended up in the mitochondria in the end. Uh, and this is, we had some uh, different, different hypotheses of what could be done there. Very strong hypothesis from very, very intelligent people. And then we have a, uh, a talk about that was a quite like intense talk because of course everyone was arguing by their their own hypothesis, and this was two things that was nice for me. First, because one guy from a different group was presenting a result that he could not explain, and I start to laugh at that point because I have pointed exactly the same thing as a hypothesis, and I have to find that. And if I find that then we will be a strong signal for what I was proposing. And then when he said, oh, okay, just say to uh, give me five minutes when I start and I'll go to that. But I, that was really nice because totally independent of me. <laughs> Someone did it in a different way. Uh, and I could, so there was other hypothesis, but the thing is that, you know, the Oaken Razor, my hypothesis could explain their hypothesis, but their hypothesis could not explain mine. So we ended up like uh, doing some other uh, questions. And at, at that meeting, we had uh, Chris Mason. So Chris Mason was quite involved in the, in the twin study. I can talk more about that with two astronauts that uh, was, was, think about a proud family. This will be that family. Uh, both were astronauts. One stay on the space station for one year. One stayed here. And they could try to see what was different. And I remember Sylvain asked Chris, Chris, the thing that we're telling us here about mitochondria, have you saw anything on the on the twin study? At that point, the twin study have, was not published yet. So, oh yeah, nope. All the time, shoot some days on, on space and start to see mitochondrial debris on, on the on the blood. <laughs> I could have kissed the guy at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and that was when we decided we agreed on the mitochondria hypothesis. After that was more two years of a lot of work. Oh, wow. uh, because of course, go from one way to the other was not that we have was all the work was volunteered. So and we could we saw totally different things you know happening, but there's one core thing happening in all the cells we saw, all the organs we see, and then we check it on the astronauts and was there too. That mitochondria seems uh, pathways related to mitochondria seems to be altered. Some right. up. Some doubt, <laughs> so little, and it was make my life difficult to try to explain, but we did. Uh, but if you put mitochondria in the center, all the other things start to make sense. 
yeah. So this what was paper about. Yeah, that I mean, I think that's fascinating. And like you say, it's it's amazing with multiomics that you kind of come at, at it from lots, so many different angles. Um, I, I'll, I kind of want to ask you a little bit more about that um, in a bit, but I think um, it would be great to, as you, you've kind of alluded to them a little bit there, um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about NASA's Gene Lab platform um, and also the twin study. Okay, so NASA Gene Lab is for me one of the most important space biology tools we have now, and I don't say that lightly. First, I would not be here talking to you if not by Gene Lab. You know, I would never would enter a space research if not by Gen Lab. You know, we have like a small grant, but that small grant unfortunately ended, and we could not we changed countries. We could not follow through. Uh, so it would be so just a nice start to tell my friends in the future if not by that. Uh, but what Gen Lab does nowadays is a repository of omics data that's public accessible in the whole world. That means that anyone right now in any part of the world could be a space scientist. Anyone. Something that was not even a possibility five, six years ago. It's accessible for now to everyone. Uh, of course, it's much more difficult if you want to send something to space. You know, <laughs> we have a reviewer proposing that to us in a paper I sent. And I said politely <laughs> that even if I got approved, it, it's going to seven to ten years just of waiting. <laughs> so for that paper, <laughs> would not be possible. <laughs> so, but the data is there, and the good thing about omics, as I said, is that there's so many things happening and so difficult to focus, and this is why it's so easy to get lost. So we ended up seeing one thing there when we could explain a really important thing. But there are a lot of things we could not touch because it was not the point of the paper. I'm trying to touch on some of this now, but again, I can only see what I can see. Where people with different backgrounds are going to look at that and have a different way of seeing things. So the possibility of the space biology get really faster and really bigger just because GenLab exists is yeah. really great. And they are wonderful people. They're so <laughs> nice. I would not like to hang out with them every time I can. Like the people in the lab is quite nice. Uh, the whole people. And then they have this analyzing working groups. It started originally with four multiomics, animals, microbes, and plants. And everyone was trying to do their bigger project. Uh, it was quite nice after we finally uh, published the mitochondrial paper. One good friend of mine, Richard Barker, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy from the uh, plant group. He said, you know, William, this is so basic that I was quite surprised that I have not solved things in plants before. This was based off my fear during the whole paper. If this is so important, so basic, why no one has solved before? Uh, so I, so I, I really, I'm really thinking about it. So I tried to see plants and I could not. So what I did, I take all my genes from plants and I use and I use the homologs for animals, the, the closest thing I could have. And you know what I what I find if I, if I do that, you know, mitochondria all over the place. <laughs> like, yep, so they're not looking the same place then. So that was good. So there's a there's a paper that can give rise to a lot of odors, and this is the best kind of paper. I'm still amazed and afraid of this paper because I know it was a good thing, and I'm totally afraid I never do something as good again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure you will. I'm sure you yeah. will. Um, I wanted to ask you, because yeah, like you say, it's such a big paper and you use so much data. I think I read it was the sort of largest cohort of astronaut data um, for use in analysis. Um, so, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned a little bit about data oh, integration yeah. and, and things like that. So what challenges did that pose um, or what challenges did you face in, in the paper that or in the was, study? No, that was a lot of things. Well, first, you know, because no one knows everything. That, that's where we start. I am much more a transcriptomic guy than I am any other thing. So I can understand and interpret other things. But if you go to proteomics and metabolomics, oh my God, they're two different beasts. Uh, but we have some good guys there doing the microbiome and the the, the proteome and the metabolomics. Yeah. Uh, the epigenetics too. So the epigenetics was a different group, but we found less things on the epigenetics. So epigenetics is a little more difficult if you don't have a, like a bigger group and so on. Uh, and of course, if you look 
if you look through specific places, you will see different things. Uh, one alteration that's quite important on the adrenal gland, which would possibly not be that much important on, a, on the eye and so on. So that was something that was difficult because this I had to argue a lot. And this is my one of my strongest points on the group as a health professional and not as a computer scientist. Uh, even if my analysis sometimes was not as refined as other people's analysis, because they're again really good people in the group. Uh, when the analysis was done and the data was able to be interpreted, I, I get uh, I, I got like a, an easier way to, to to bind them together and make sense of the results and try to explain this a better way. So I was doing a lot of analysis. <laughs> That's <laughs> what was. But I could take other people' analysis and put in context of what I found. And this was really complicated because again, a lot of, of data were we have to prior, prioritize and see what what to focus. Because if not, we would really get lost. There's a lot of stories there as the one on the liver and the uh, and uh, muscle that we were simply not able to tell at that point. There are too many things happening. So the data integration was quite, quite uh, a problem. And we kind of did this in a figure out as we go. What's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but this is how we could and work it for us. Uh, so this is something that that was yeah was difficult. There's no no other way to say that it was yeah. difficult. Well, um, did you have any sort of tools available to you to sort of help overcome these challenges? Um, I think you mentioned before like maybe a data visualization tool that was really useful. Oh, or... Yeah, so uh, these people on California and I'm terrible for names. I'm really sorry for that <laughs> people. Uh, they did like a new visualization too, like for networking. Mm. So if you take a GSEA, it's a quite nice tool, but they give you a really long table. <laughs> it's really difficult <laughs> to analyze this really long table. There are different ways of doing it, but yeah, that's what they do. There are different ways that you could try to put this together, uh, but ended up they had developed a new visualization tool that was able to uh, put different data sets on the same on the same analysis and shoot different like bubbles of things and they could, could link to the different things. Uh, so this was quite useful to interpretation because you could try to see the patterns happening and where where we're appearing and what data sets they were appearing because not all pathways being altered in all, all organs or all cells. You know, but when you put everything together and they have a mess, then they start, okay, let's let's stop here. I, I passed a long time of of my research life in the last years just looking into different bubbles and different clusters and trying to see what was there. Yeah. So visualization, of course, is quite uh, a uh, difficult thing in the field yet because make us could make us life easier or could make us life difficult. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um well, yeah, I think that's a really good idea, uh, example of like a great tool that's helped you. Um, I wanted to come back to something you mentioned because you were saying that in, in in the research you were able to look at it from like a different perspective to some of perhaps like the bioinformaticians or other other people with like more of a statistical background or comp computational background. Um, and I think that links in nicely to um, kind of the spaceomics topical team. Um, and kind of the idea of like international collaboration around that and getting different perspectives. So could you tell us a little bit more about that team? Oh yeah, of course. So uh, as I think, uh, my involvement with this started with NASA when I was working in the USA. But after some time after that, I moved to Belfast, Northern Ireland. So I got away from, from the US, got to Europe, uh, and now I, 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 there are things that NASA could not do for me. For example, NASA don't send money away from the USA. So you mm -hmm. can keep collaborating with them, but they don't send money away. Uh, so if I want to keep strong on this field, and I totally want, I had to find ways to work more with the European uh, partners on, on this. Fortunately to me, there was a lot of European-based researchers on GenLab. So it starts from there the analysis working group. The, just before the pandemic, we had one event on the US happening right now. I think the ASS, I 
I always forget the, the name of it. Uh, but like the biggest, the biggest one uh, space event we have, like everyone got there in the end. And I was going, I was invited uh, by NASA to give a talk about our work that was about to be published at that point. I thought, okay, that's it. I'm going to send an email to all the rocket based people that I know, and I'm going to try to have coffee with all of them and see what happens. Uh, so I started to send crazy emails to everyone. Hi, my name is William. We are part of Gen Lab. Could we would have a talk next uh, time next week to have a talk, maybe under a coffee? Uh, I was able to organize three or four of this. And at one point, I was talking with uh, Raul, Raul Hernandez from Madrid. And I was basically saying, okay, it would be quite nice if we did something together. What wouldn't it? And say, oh, William, uh, have you ever talked about, you know, we could try to find a topical team? Uh, what? Yeah, no, as I have these teams, these topical teams are organized by topic and supposed to put people together and use like a platform to grow in the field. Do you think this would be a nice idea? Oh, wow, I'm loving this idea. But yeah, so let's try to do that then. So Raul is the head of the of the team. And I started with him to try to organize more or less in the modern of the modes of GenLab. And we we're able to take all the European based uh, from GenLab from there, some others. So we have people from the UK, from Spain, from France, from Germany, from Sweden, from the Belgium. And I'm probably forgetting some some country here, but we have like a, a big group of people initially just to talk with each other and to do things with each other. We're going to meet uh, now in Madrid in December. Uh, the final thing, you know, we did our work during the pandemic. We just finished publishing a special edition on the European contribution to space omics on high science, and one of the flagships of the flagship of the of the special edition was a review about what was done in Europe on space omics. Yeah, even with, we found some members of the group as we're doing that. Uh, but the whole, the, the whole idea of this work was, OK, we need to know who is doing what, where, and who is paying for it. Yeah. So we're able to get to get this huge, uh, huge vision about it and including uh, funding and problems of funding out the others. For example, in the US, NASA pays for everything, you only one country. But in Europe, it's much more complicated. You have ESA and they have a national space agency over the place. They talk with each other and sometimes they don't. Uh, so we're and trying to see how it goes. And the, my whole point and our whole point here is that we are in the strategic position to do much more than we, are, we do. We have a really good infrastructure, really good people, and uh, space agents in different countries are trying to make space more accessible. So this is this is the time to put more investment on that. And we could we do we did a lot of things. First, by influence of the members of the group, not me, <laughs> I'm not that big, <laughs> but by influence of the members of the group, uh, as I put on their strategy, uh, omics and bioinformatics. Uh, it's not it's still being developed, it, but it's more or less in the final steps of it. That's going to be part of the strategy now. The other thing that as I started, not by our influence, but totally something that we want to tap in is a network of, uh, of projects that they want to do between industry, uh, academy and as a and to give some money from that. And if you and this you get the money approved, you get both the money, you get like even more money yet to try to do some develop biological developments based on space, not only omics, but I'm sure omics will be quite important for that. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that sounds like a fascinating project. Um, and I, I'm guessing that's something you'll be working on, you know, from now and yeah. in the future. <laughs> yeah, this is um, part of what I want. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, is there anything else like so, uh, so thinking about the future? Is there anything emerging or um, any sort of research areas that you're particularly excited about? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'm quite, uh, quite uh, interested in follow through our 2020 paper mm -hmm. and see about like mitochondrial. This thing is we buy by all makes integration. We saw a pattern that seems to be related to omics, uh, to mitochondrial dysfunction. But we never we never plan to test it. We're just analyzing the data we have. And we do have uh, a lot of older papers supporting our view. 
uh, but no one ever tested it by itself. You know, uh, last year I was having a training of NASA, NASA Star Program, and one of the directors was presenting things, and then he he presented my paper, and I commented on the things. I love this paper by no reason at all. <laughs> and then oh, you are here, nice to meet you. And then he showed some older papers, older papers of him, where my founder was there on the top. And he never really bothered to look <laughs> because he was thinking about different things. So we really have to go and, and see uh, how strong and where exactly is this mitochondrial function. Because, of course, this will be to see how to treat it. Another thing is that if mitochondria is altered, I'm really interested to see what's happening with chloroplasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're not that different. Uh, there's uh, some companies that have reached to option the hash to try to say, okay, if mitochondria is a problem, why we don't give a, like something to the astronauts against to try to fight it? And it's not that simple, of course, but that's something that I'm really interesting to interested to follow through too. You know, uh, again, because my and mitochondria is one of the principal things related to aging, and aging is something that interests me a lot as a concept. I I'm, I'm trying to make the, the bridge between how much I'm doing with uh, with space biology now to also be an aging researcher. So I have some small research on it at this point, but this is really where I want to focus my, my career for now on. Yeah, I think it sounds incredibly interesting. Um, and like you say, I mean, because it's around the mitochondria, I'm so sure there's so many applications <laughs> in that area. <laughs> Um, you know, I can't wait to see sort of where your research takes you. Um, I've got sort of a final question. Obviously, um, you, we're going to be hearing more about your work at the Festival of Genomics and Biodata in January. Um, could you tell us a little bit about perhaps what you're going to be speaking about there, but also why you're looking forward to the festival? Uh, OK, so I'm going to, to talk there a little of what we talked today. You know, of course, I have to, to cite what I've done. But uh, how we can try to focus this and uh, focus this research on uh, drug development. Uh, and I never really forget my roots as a pharmacist and something that uh, uh, I was already was kind of not, not criticized, it, but I remember one of my supervisors also saying to me when I was in France, you know, William, you are a pharmacist and your analysis always show it. <laughs> because I'm trying to find the place where we could alter, the place we could try to change, not only the, the things by itself. So I'm going to focus a little more on that. Uh, what I really hope for that is just much more connections and networking. I'm I'm recently uh, I'm still new in the UK. You know I'm I moved here in 2019, just a little before one, the pandemic, <laughs> and you know it was complicated. And then I moved here to to England uh, last year. A lot of of adapting since then. So I really have to put my research as an independent researcher going on. So I want to do networking, meet possible new partners, and uh, and uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm really amazed by how the UK have the potential to do more. <laughs> of course, I want to be part of the guy doing more <laughs> too. <laughs> this is what excited me because there's already a something happening, but not as much as it could. So I could bring, I want to bring attention to the people and basically say, if you put money on it, you're going to get money out of it. Just give us a chance. You know, there's a, things are going that direction. Let's be part of this too. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of all we've got time for oh. um, today. Um, but it's been really, really great chatting to you. I've learned so much about space omics that I did not know before. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions. Oh. With us. It was quite a pleasure, Lauren. I hope the, the people watching will like it too. Thank you.